Welcome everyone to Quantix Building Products' third webinar on the Energy Star version 6 updates. Today, we'll be discussing EPA cost analysis and the impact different components have on reaching your Energy Star goals cost effectively. If you haven't already, please be sure to visit our dedicated resource center at www.quantix.com slash Energy Star for more information and tools. My name is Kiri Sheets, and I'm the Trade Show and Event Specialist here at Quantix and your moderator today. I've been with Quantix for three years and in the industry for more than eight years. Today's webinar brings it all together. We're getting into the details of the specific ways to analyze your Windows efficiencies and meet the new Energy Star requirements. If this is your first time logging into our Energy Star webinar series, welcome. For those of you who have joined us for our last ones in March or April, thank you for joining us again. Our presentation will last about 30 to 40 minutes today, followed by a question and answer session where we'll, we will be able to answer your questions that you can submit throughout the presentation. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items. Please be sure to disable pop-up blockers on your computer for the best viewing experience. You can adjust your screen view in the lower left-hand corner. If you're having trouble viewing the entire slide, click on the Fit in Viewer option. If you have questions for today's speaker throughout the presentation or if you're experiencing technical difficulties, just message me directly using the Q&A feature to the right. You can also send an email to quantixpr at quantix.com with any technical issues. We'll be monitoring that email throughout the webinar as well. We'll have two polling questions throughout the 30-minute webinar. To participate, please answer the questions that appear on the right-hand side of your screen. Don't forget to hit submit so we can see your answers. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Rick Jackson is the Director of Government Relations at Quantix. He's an active member of the NFRC and WDMA and has been key in the development of industry standards. He has extensive knowledge in the Energy Star changes and has worked to break this down into an easy to understand process. Rick, take it away. Thanks, Gary. Uh, today we're going to discuss the uh, uh, EPA cost uh, analysis and component impacts on uh, window designs that can actually affect that. Uh, but before we do that, I want to just go back through a little bit of background for those of you that are joining us for the first time on this webinar. If I were a window manufacturer today, the first question I'd probably be asking myself is, why should I even continue to participate in Energy Star? Uh, there are a number of reasons that I think are worth considering, but probably the first one you want to ask yourself is, what is my competition likely to do? And to that end, uh, I recently was uh, speaking with EPA and uh, they told me that the IVP uh, requirement for everybody to list uh, product lines that they're currently selling was up to 250 out of 300 participants in Energy Star certification. So I think one answer would be that uh, a large percentage of window manufacturers, uh, at least as far as independent verification is concerned, uh, are continuing to participate in the program going forward. The second reason that I, I would uh, consider continuing to be involved in the Energy Star program is simply the, the brand recognition and the marketing potential. Uh, not so much today that it's a differentiating feature. You probably have plenty of other differentiating features in your window, but today it becomes more of a table stakes issue. Consumers continue to demand uh, Energy Star products in all the variety of categories from appliances through building materials. This chart uh, probably best represents uh, how significant that endorsement by consumers for Energy Star is today. Uh, this is a chart that's uh, been prepared by EPA and then updated uh, recently by myself with Ducker data from 2012. Clearly the program reached its peak in 2010, at least that was the study year that was uh, reported prior to the 2012 data point. when. Uh, over 80% of all windows being sold were Energy Star rated. Uh, Ducker re-ran the study in 2013 with data up to 2012, and even though we saw a drop back in new construction slipping from uh, just under 80% to uh, just under 70%, the R&R &R category of window sales remained strong at 81%. So even with the tax credit uh, sunsetting in 2011, uh, and in 2012 being probably more of a uh, hangover year, uh, the program continues to draw a large percentage of consumers' demand. Another consideration are uh, 
the remaining credits that are out there or financial incentives. Even though we've seen the end of the 25C federal tax credit, uh, although there's been legislation proposed by both House and Senate uh, members to uh, resurrect that through a tax extender, I think it's highly unlikely we're going to see that uh, this year. Uh, but there are a huge number of incentive programs that continue to exist at both the state uh, and local municipality and utility levels. In fact, uh, under the category of energy efficient improvements, there's over 1,100 uh, incentive programs. There are personal tax credits and sales tax credits available. And uh, the majority of incentives that relate to window, door, skylight products I uh, do require Energy Star's the base performance standard. And then finally, home builders, uh, not a category you would expect to see uh, looking for premium products, but uh, home builders continue to embrace the Energy Star for Homes program. And in fact, in data reported again for 2012, over 100,000 homes were built to the Energy Star certification uh, standard for homes. And that's about uh, a little over 8% of, of all new homes uh, constructed. Uh, you can go to the Energy Star for Homes website, and by looking at the partner locator, you can see lists of builders in your regions of sales that actually are participants in the Energy Star for Homes. And of course, Energy Star for Homes requires Energy Star window products. Some states have as high as 40% uh, share of new construction that's uh, Energy Star for Homes rated. Uh, with some of the highest ranking states, uh, such as Delaware, uh, again, at that, that uh, higher level. So just a brief recap, I'm sure everybody on the phone by now knows exactly what the changes are, but just to kind of uh, summarize it again, what is changing with version 6? Uh, the big change, in my opinion, is the northern zone reduction. Uh, the 3030 tax credit actually put uh, 0.30 U-factor windows in all four uh, marketing zones or climactic zones, but the big change is actually dropping approximately 10% in the northern zone, uh, and that, uh, I think, is, is the biggest impact on the majority of uh, window manufacturers that market into that area. The biggest change is, in fact, the southern zone U-factor, which is being reduced by 33%. Uh, but that was already uh, in effect with the IECC 2015 standards that are coming in, into place. So just to, again, to look at the, the chart and uh, see the specific numbers, here what I draw your attention to is the equivalencies. Uh, this is an opportunity, if you're marketing in the northern zone, to take uh, a glass package that increases the solar heat gain coefficient in exchange for a uh, higher U-factor requirement. So here what uh, EPA has done is provided what uh, are direct energy equivalencies where if a window has a higher solar heat gain, meaning more free solar heat in the winter months, uh, that will balance out against a higher U-factor or less insulating uh, properties in the window. And again, there are three levels of equivalencies here that are direct trade-offs and uh, another option uh, where possibly combinations of glass and uh, maybe less aggressive U-factor positioning of your window can get you uh, certified. The big question that, that I've been asking myself, and again I think is a concern uh, on the minds of many manufacturers, is how competitive will I be with the choices that I've had to make to improve my window to meet this criteria? And with that, Carrie. All right, well, thanks for that review, Rick. So before we dive into the details, we have a quick polling question located at the lower right of your screen. What is the cost difference you expect between current Energy Star and Energy Star V6 products? Please click on the answer you believe is most accurate in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen and hit Submit. We'll give everyone a few seconds to respond and for the results to calculate. While we're waiting, we wanted to mention that this is our third webinar in Quantex's Energy Star series. We have a few more throughout 2014, and the next one will be about federal, state, and utility incentives in July. We will also have future webinars on Quantex IG solutions and Quantex window and door system solutions. Check back on www.quantex.com slash Energy Star for updates on dates and times for these presentations. Okay, so our poll is in, and it looks like 
Most of you have chosen uh, the first option, zero to 10% increase as the cost difference you expect to see there. So great. Um, Rick, what do you uh, have to say about this? I, I, th I think that's great. Uh, actually, when we get further into the presentation, uh, I've got some analysis that EPA conducted that talks about uh, the range of performance uh, related to cost improvements. And I think 10% is a pretty safe number. If you can actually uh, make the improvements that you need to make to meet Energy Star version 6, and particularly, again, in the northern zone, uh, within a 10% cost increase, and certainly that allows you some possible margin opportunity, then I think you'll be well within safe ground. If you're over 25% in terms of a cost increase, I'd be concerned about being as competitive given what we know about window manufacturers that already have achieved these levels of performance with existing products. So with that, I'm going to dive into this uh, EPA analysis. And there's a link on the uh, slide that you're looking at that we'll send out in a follow-up email. So uh, you don't necessarily need to take notes uh, from that point of view. But uh, And if you have not been tracking uh, EPA's documentation of the process that they went through through each of the drafts, uh, this is a good place to go to see uh, how they treated cost effectiveness and payback analysis, which was certainly a big industry concern. Uh, a number of associations uh, suggested that any payback that took more than 10 years for the cost difference of an Energy Star version 6 product uh, really wouldn't be uh, of value to consumers. And so EPA went out and they uh, elicited uh, data from eight companies confidentially, maybe one of you is, is on the call today, and they received 92 data points that allowed them to uh, plot and look at uh, the payback. And the formula is a fairly simple one. They're really looking at the incremental cost plus what they call marginal cost, and I'll explain that in a few minutes, times the number of windows in a house, divided by the incremental energy savings, and that equals payback. And their target was to have that payback uh, be less than 10 years. And again, just the definitions, the incremental cost is the incremental cost over an Energy Star version 6 window uh, as based on the proposed draft 1 version 6. So again, focusing on the northern zone, the difference between draft 1 and the final draft was non-existent. The, the target was the same. There was some fluctuation in the north central and south central zones, uh, which basically both rounded to 0 0.30. The marginal cost is the difference between an Energy Star version 5 window and a code window. Uh, the windows per house is obvious, and so is the incremental energy savings that uh, calculated based on the city, and then uh, that generates a payback. So here are the numbers, and I want to caution, these are the incremental cost to the consumer, because obviously the payback is, is calculated for the consumer. And they found that uh, the northern zone, uh, that the average cost uh, was $34 per window. And this would be a typical 3050 uh, double hung window. In the north central, it was $28. In the south central, it was $21. Kind of interesting because they both have the same U-factor target, but they have substantially different solar heat gain targets. And in the southern zone, it would add $13 to the consumer. So depending on how you go to market, you can back into what your cost premium would be that would afford you uh, the ability to get that product to the consumer at these incremental costs. The marginal cost that they calculate is the same for all four zones, uh, $20. So that brings us up to a $54 premium in the north and a $33 premium in the south. So taking that uh, payback equation and Plugging in some actual numbers for consumers, uh, the incremental cost ranging between $13 and $34. Uh, the climate zone that was chosen for this example is Binghamton, New York, so it's clearly in the northern zone. The marginal cost of $20, which is the same regardless of where you are in the country. Uh, most manufacturers selling uh, version 5 uh, in all climate zones, five of the manufacturers sell in all five of the climate zones, four of the climate zones. So, so really out of the eight, uh, the majority were uh, selling into all. And the window per house average that they used was 22 windows per house. And the incremental energy savings uh, for 
Binghamton, New York was $158.33. So this, uh, in this particular climate zone with this particular uh, average cost, uh, clearly they could achieve numbers below 10 years in payback, so 7.5. I think another uh, example of using this is it's excellent m a marketing tool when you don't want to predict or guarantee a consumer, which we can't do today, what their savings would be. Examples like this that are documented by EPA are, are good uh, examples that can be used, fictitious, but at least give the consumer some indication of what they might be able to expect. So uh, I mentioned that they also broke up this cost effectiveness study into ranges, and uh, they chose three, uh, high average incremental cost, an average average incremental cost, and a low average incremental cost. And the reason that I, I wanted to show this and draw your attention to it is this is the range of incremental cost that different manufacturers in that population of eight uh, see in terms of what they would have to do to, to meet the criteria for version six. And so from the average uh, to the best, we're talking about a gap of 16%. From the low to the highest average cost, 37%. So there's quite a range of costs based on what manufacturers see the requirements being for them to meet the criteria. So again, uh, I think targeting the low end, it's 9.5 years here. I kind of equate that to the 10% category. And I equate the 11.5 to the next range from 11% up to 25, and I equate the high uh, at a 37% premium in terms of cost as being that uh, over 25% increase that we talked about in the uh, previous slides. So now to just focus on the components, and we're gonna use examples today calculated using the optimizer the Quantix Optimizer program, if you aren't already using it, uh, certainly uh, download it. It's available as an iPad app, and it's also available as a standalone website program where you can just go and access the Optimizer. And you can see what the impact of various components would be on these generic and, and specific window examples that we're going to use. And then I've got a little tool at the end, which is just a simple calculation to allow you to kind of maybe prioritize or rank those, uh, again, specific to your window, plugging in your own uh, costs in your own uh, uh, consideration. So, Carrie? All right, let's get another quick poll question in before we cover the impact of different components on thermal performance. So what component do you believe has the most impact on a window's thermal performance? Is it A, frame? B, glass, C, spacer, or D, gas fill? Simply click on your answer in the bottom right hand of your screen and hit submit, and Rick will be discussing each of these components and which have the most impact on your systems. And we'll, uh, looks like we still have some answers coming in, so we'll give it just another couple seconds. All right, it looks like most of you feel that the frame um, is the component that has the most impact on the window performance. So Rick, hey, can hey. go ahead and talk. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, well, again, that's, that's uh, good news because traditionally the frame has been the area to have the most influence on thermal performance of a window. And really to appreciate that, you almost have to go back to the days of non-thermally broken aluminum windows where U factors were up in the 1.5 to 2.0 range. And I'm not talking decimal, I'm talking actual full number 1.5 to 2. Now, for today's discussions, we're actually already necking down to highly efficient frame materials. So we're focusing on vinyl products uh, for this discussion, uh, and we're specifically looking at vinyl products that actually have been somewhat optimized for thermal performance. So we're talking about hollow profiles, we're talking about profiles with chambers, and we're talking about uh, high performance profiles with multi-chambered uh, cavities that allow for uh, increased thermal performance. So the differences you're going to see are going to be a little bit smaller than uh, we would have seen had we done this analysis 10 years ago where there was quite a mixture of products in the marketplace. Uh, the second area, of course, uh, beside the frame is the center of glass. And as this little image uh, shows, the way the window is broken down in the computer modeling is into three zones. 
Uh, the frame makes up about 20% of the total window area, but has a significant influence on the thermal performance of the window. The center of glass is defined as the area, the 75% of window area uh, beyond the edge of glass, and then the edge of glass makes up about 5% of the window. The edge of glass is where it almost all comes together. Heat flowing into the glass is concentrated at the edge, and the impact of the spacer and the frame both uh, also coincide there to create a lot of heat transfer. So edge of glass, even though it's a uh, very small area of the window, is also an area where you get a lot of, uh, a lot of impact. So again, I already said it, the frame uh, traditionally has the most impact, and if we were looking at all frame material types today, uh, we'd still conclude that the frame is number one, glass number two, spacer is number three, and gas fill is, is number four on the list in terms of impact. And this diagram actually uh, shows, or this image of the thermal uh, performance of this window, this thermogram, is an excellent way to see that concentration I mentioned, that 5% at the edge of the glass which is about a one inch band of glass area, is highly influenced by the heat flowing through and across the spacer. But what's also interesting is you look further down, you see areas in the vinyl that are also conducting a lot of heat energy across the window. So those vertical members, which are the walls that form the chambers, really don't have a significant impact on heat transfer. It's the horizontal members that actually flow through the cross section of the window. And the further you get away from the base of the IG unit, the less and less that impact uh, is, uh, is uh, seen. So here are some specific examples. And uh, to preface this first slide, this is based on uh, a generic vinyl window with an aluminum spacer bar. And I know most of you are going to say, well, nobody uses aluminum spacer bar today. But just so that we get a kind of a baseline uh, in terms of values, and when we transition to some of the other slides, you'll see the impact uh, as we transition away from an aluminum spacer bar to various warm edge options. But here we're comparing first, what would happen if I put a surface four low E on a double uh, going from a single surface of low E on that same double in that same uh, window? And what we see is about a 16% drop, about a 0.047 U factor improvement. That is very, very significant. So if one of the options you have available to you today is a surface four low E, uh, and you're not concerned with uh, condensation resistance issues, which may result in some areas of the country, uh, then this is an absolutely excellent way to get a very big U-factor uh, impact on that window. We're also comparing here the impact of uh, different uh, gas fills. So take that same window, uh, at the 0.336 U factor level with the aluminum spacer bar air filled uh, and keeping just one light of low E but uh, argon filling, you get a 0 0.033. So again, a fairly significant impact on 11% lower total window U factor for uh, adding argon in that same double. Now if you take that argon filled double and actually converted it to an argon filled triple with three layers of low E, you could be looking at as much as almost a 0.08 U-factor improvement, 34%. Today, it's unlikely you're going to need triples to meet the criteria in the northern zone. I think the majority of window manufacturers uh, can get there with a variety of different options without going all the way to triples. But if you're thinking about the future and possibly uh, wanting to participate in the most efficient program, uh, or just simply targeting the lowest U factor that you can uh, possibly get to, then certainly a, uh, a triple argon and with up to three surfaces of low E is a, a good uh, way to go. If you took that same triple, and for reasons of inefficiencies, I'm not showing uh, or not talking about our, our krypton filled doubles, you can actually uh, improve that argon filled triple as long as they're optimum krypton gaps, uh, something in the range of three-eighths or marginally less, you can achieve another 17% uh, lower U-factor and at this point drop that same uh, generic vinyl window hollow frame section with an aluminum spacer bar, actually get, get it down to, to below the 0.2 threshold for today's uh, most efficient program. 
Now, if we're looking at the vinyl and the spacer impacts, because the two almost go hand in hand, uh, the first example we're looking at here is just simply taking a generic vinyl frame and foam filling it. And surprisingly enough, uh, depending on the frame design, of course, that doesn't have as big an impact as many would think. Uh, here we're looking at only a 4% lower U factor putting in a polyurethane foam into a generic vinyl window. And that, by the way, is a single cavity uh, section that is foam filled. If we take uh, that same generic vinyl window, hollow, and compare it to a high performance uh, hollow uh, frame section, such as the one that was shown in the thermogram, uh, we could be looking at as much as a 0 0.026 uh, reduction in U-factor, or 8% lower. So again, this is hollow to hollow, uh, but that's a fairly significant. And one of the reasons that I think that this is important to consider, uh, meaning uh, using high-performance frame sections, is if this was the last version of Energy Star that we're likely to see, you probably could make the changes you would need to make and avoid having to substitute a different frame section. But if you believe, like I do, that Energy Star will continue uh, to increase the performance requirements, then making a frame choice uh, now may be the most economical in the long run. Uh, and again, it tees you up for much higher performance products going forward. So again, these examples are with aluminum bar, uh, but you can see on the next slide what happens when you substitute a high performance flexible spacer in place of an aluminum spacer bar. And here we're talking about a 0.034 U-factor improvement or 10% lower on that generic vinyl window. So I said I was gonna share with you just a little simple uh, calculation that you might do if you've already been looking at all of these options. The first thing is you really only have uh, choices to make a whole uh, category upgrade or, or substitution. You can't get just part of the spacer substitution. You can't get just part of the vinyl substitution or the foam filling. Uh, you pretty much have to take it as a, as a bucket, if you will. So the simple calculation is just taking the upgrade cost uh, as a percentage of the window divided by the U-factor improvement to come up with kind of an index cost. And I'll show you what I mean with this uh, chart here. So here are the examples that I've shown uh, on the previous slides in the charts of the various substitutions that you can make. And you can achieve anywhere from uh, 0.047 to uh, a 0.015 improvement in total window U factor. And in the second column, I've expressed that as the upgrade cost percent of a base window. So, uh, and we've indexed the window up to $100. I mean, the raw material or component cost is not gonna be $100 uh, for your window, most likely. Uh, we, by the way, are not using labor uh, or any sort of investment cost here. This is purely the uh, upgrade cost of the components going into the window. And then we've taken that and we've divided, as I said, the upgrade cost percent by uh, the U factor, 0.01 U factor improvement in the window to kind of rank these. And so for purposes of the examples I've shown today, the most cost-effective upgrade is two per, uh, would be 2% per 0.01 U-factor improvement. Now, again, caution, you can't buy a 0.01 U-factor improvement. You have to buy a 0.047. So this is where you actually need to look at the uh, performance requirement you need to achieve with your window and, and then uh, do the calculation based on the total window upgrade cost. The second, and actually the lowest as a percent of the total window cost, is the spacer. Again, many of you are probably already using high performance flexible spacers today or other variations on high performance uh, rigid spacers today. Uh, if you are, then that's probably not an option if you still need to uh, achieve a higher performance level. But if that is a category you haven't deployed yet, it can be very, very cost effective. Uh, the high performance frame. I think everybody thinks the frame is such an expensive component in the window that the cost to switch to a higher performance vinyl frame system uh, might be uh, exorbitant and not practical. But the reality is that uh, 
it can be as low as 5% of the total window cost per 0.01 U-factor improvement, and it comes with a, a fairly reasonable uh, U-factor, total U-factor improvement. I mean, we're talking 0.02 to 0.03 U-factor improvement. So if you're 0.02 away from achieving the number, this might be a good option. The foam filling is actually uh, a small increment, but a relatively high cost, uh, partly because uh, it's a relatively inefficient process. And then finally, uh, gas filling. And here we're examining argon uh, conversion to krypton. And again, if you're not uh, going after the, the grand prize for the lowest U-factor window on the market, uh, this is probably the last choice you want to make. Uh, converting to krypton from argon is by far the most expensive uh, uh, component substitution that you could make. So just to, to summarize in conclusion, you know, we, we still see a, a large percentage of consumers uh, buying ENERGY STAR labeled windows, particularly in the R&R market, even without the tax credit. Uh, so uh, keeping the, the label on your product and uh, keeping uh, consumers uh, happy with that marketing uh, performance level is, is a good thing. Uh, many of the other financial incentives that are available in the market uh, continue to use Energy Star as the performance criteria, and I, I personally think we're going to see some rise in that. I think there's more uh, activity going on at the utilities level uh, to adopt uh, standards for performance that are uniform across the entire marketplace as opposed to specific performance targets. Uh, EPA has done a, a good job of studying the cost effectiveness. Uh, version 6 in all four zones, although I think the northern zone is really the one that most of us are concerned about today, and they've determined that a 10-year payback threshold is achievable. Uh, various component substitutions have better or worse cost to U-factor improvement impact, and it, you want to look at those very carefully uh, and also consider the labor impact, the marketing impact, and the uh, potential investment impact uh, on your business. The Quantix Optimizer continues to be an excellent tool. Uh, the special edition actually has the uh, Energy Star zones already built into it, so you can use those as filters if you're doing that kind of work. And we also have a uh, custom solutions program available that uh, allows you to have a personal, private, and confidential uh, optimizer version that has your actual windows. So regardless of the 11 or 12 window systems that are in the optimizer today, you can have your vinyl product uh, coded into it so that you can look at your specific window. And I, I would strongly encourage you, even if you already have a qualifying product today, continue to investigate uh, the most cost-effective solution. You may never need to deploy it, but if you do, uh, having uh, the answer to the question, what is the most uh, cost-effective substitution I can make to get my window to meet the criteria uh, can only be good for your business. And with that, Carrie? All right. Thanks, Rick. As I said earlier, our next webinar will be in July on federal, state, and utility incentives. Here, you'll see the other webinars we'll be holding throughout the year. We've got exciting stuff coming up, so stay tuned for specific dates and times, and you can always check out our Energy Star resource page at www.quantix.com slash Energy Star for more information. This concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. We'll be starting our Q&A session in just a minute, so please uh, submit those questions by using the Q&A feature to the right, and we'll get to those in just a few moments. Rick, it looks like um, you were so thorough that we don't have any questions today, but um, for those of you still on the phone, if you do think of a question to ask later, please feel free to email us at quantixpr at quantix.com. And um, we will also be following up with anybody that does have uh, any questions to submit later. And um, in the meantime, don't forget to complete that survey. And um, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us, and have a great afternoon.